you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks, this is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show, my friends. And now a man who thinks pants are completely overrated, uh, <laughs> maybe shorts too, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what I'm wearing underneath all this uh, podcast equipment. Uh, anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. We <laughs> really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, go to YouTube.com, for just Chris Voss, or Council Goodreads.com, for just Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there. Go to uh, all of our groups on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those crazy places the kids are playing these days. Uh, we have an amazing multi-book author on the show. We're talking about uh, his uh, stories, his history, and what he puts into his books. His latest book that has just come out, July 3rd, 2022, The Last Ark, Lost Secrets of Qumran? Do I have the Qumran. 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 Qumran, the Snow Chronicles by Guy Morrison. As you can hear, he is live on the show with us today. So that's always good to have him live so he can tell us what's going on with these amazing books that he has. So we're talking about those as well. Uh, he's, he is retired uh, from a 36-year leadership career with a Fortune 100 software, high-tech, and global energy company guy morris guy morris has also been a published songwriter for disney records screenplay writer for sojourn entertainment a patented inventor a coast guard charter captain a patty driver uh adventure and now an author of intelligent well-researched thrillers since his 2021 debut as an indie author he's released three pulse pounding thrillers inspired by true stories actual technologies true global politics and history welcome to the show guy how are you chris it's a wonderful to be here i'm so excited thank you very much for having me there you go we're we're excited to have you as well so uh congratulations on the latest book give us your dot coms wherever you want people to find you on those interwebages uh the easiest place to go is guymorrisbooks.com that will give you buy links uh fact versus fiction image libraries of actual locations review highlights uh, and links uh and farm and way more there you go there you go so you have how many books do you have out so far this is the i've had three out the last one came out this past november 22 i'm working on the fourth now mm -hmm. uh, which will be another sequel uh and um all of the books I, I i i i'm inspired a lot by by true stories and real history real facts so i like to build my fictional characters and plots on top of um, real solid mountains and legs of factual information and connect that to the real world in, in very um, hopefully creative and innovative ways uh, in part because i think i write thrillers and so there's nothing scarier going on right now than the news <laughs> so, I've seen it. Yes. If I if I could basically just add on top of that a little bit, and of course, as a thriller writer, that there's I have one question to ask: Gee, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that movie too. Sometimes yeah. uh, I don't I don't I don't want to see the 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 big ending, whatever that is. Uh, the big nuclear, whatever. But uh, so, do you do you find that because you know you were 36 years in a career with the Fortune 100 software, high tech, global energy, that kind of gives you a, a prominence or importance to try and put some of this uh, you know stuff into your in, interwoven into your stories. Absolutely. And, and I think that there were a lot of individual experiences. It was a great experience. It was a, it was a real benefit. I started off rather poor. So to be able to go work with CXOs and geniuses at Microsoft and Oracle and other places was a real honor for me. Um, but I, I, I have to say I never I was a, trained as an economist. And uh, you recently had uh, an economist on named Clara Mate, who did an excellent job at explaining some of the current issues. Um, that we're all facing with austerity and capitalism. But um, so I was trained as an economist. And, and so I had a, I always had a, a clear view of what the real dynamics were going on. And I suppose I never really fully drunk the Kool-Aid of any business because I could see the, um, the conflict between what we would 
tell our customers, what we would tell ourselves internally between the goals uh, of trying to build better products for, for customers, but yet really focusing more on profits for ourselves. Sure. And so I, I took, there was a number of experiences I had during that time that were kind of eye openers for me. Um, and some of them were because I was a, somewhat of an innovator. Uh, I was always playing with newer technologies far ahead of others in, in the business. I um, implemented early stage artificial intelligence uh, systems when I was with an oil company. Mm -hmm. um, I um, would oftentimes read science magazines that would kind of ask, force me to ask questions that I would, uh, I would really want to answer. And I think the inspiration for the swarm in the last arc started um, uh, years ago when I discovered a short Associated Press article. And the article only said, it was very, it was real short, less than two paragraphs, and basically said that a program had escaped the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories at Sandia. Oh, wow. And if someone knew anything, that they should contact either this professor at Sandia or this FBI agent in charge of the investigation. Now, and now that stunned me captivated me, mesmerized me. I, I, I became obsessed with that idea. Now, I figured two things were either somebody at Associated Press was going to get uh, a, a ding on their uh, on their performance review for a typo um, or somebody at Sandia was going to get dinged for slipping. Mm. Now, that particular lab, Lawrence Livermore Laboratories of Sandia, is a well is a well known NSA spy lab. So in my head, I'm thinking, okay, a spy program has escaped the NSA spy labs and they don't know how to find it. <laughs> and I thought that is an amazing story. So yeah. I actually spent several months trying to reverse engineer in my head the, using the, my knowledge of technology and architectures. And I'm not a developer, but I've been involved with technology my whole life. So I tried to kind of reverse engineer what kind of architectures could actually enable a program to escape an NSA spy lab mm. by itself implied an intent, um, a, a, a level of intelligence, um, the ability to move itself and the ability to basically race its log trails. Mm. Um, so I thought, well, that's that's an astounding set of capabilities. And, and we actually can kind of confirm a lot of those capabilities today through some of the more modern NSA groups like the um, Computer Network Operations, CNO group out of the NSA and other places. But back then in the late 90s, it was pretty, pretty revolutionary. Yeah. And and so then I thought, okay, well, what did the program, what was the program designed to do that it had that amazing capability to basically be um, software and stealth? Um, and, and so I, I went through my data center, I went through my home office, I went to my, my corporate office, I, I made, I kind of said, if, if I wanted to be my perfect James Bond spy program, what would I want to do? Mm -hmm. And I came up with a list of functionalities, and um, then I kind of came up with some theories as to why it left or why it was missing. And at the time, I was um, my, one of my dear friends was a film producer uh, with with uh, in Sojourn, and, and he was looking for ideas. And so we wound up producing a webisode series with this. Oh wow! Uh, out of state actor, out of work actors, photo shoots, scripts that we did a really high production job won a bunch of awards. We were optioned by one of the studios two weeks before the option was going to come due Two FBI agents show up at my door. Wow. <laughs> they were rather perturbed that I had figured out something they thought should be top secret. Now. Um, and, and I was now, of course I'm, I'm jazzed. I I'm thinking, yes, I nailed it. You know, <laughs> validation. Uh, they, they didn't want to say, they didn't want to say it in so many words. Um, my now I would only been married to my my second wife, who I'm now been married to for 30 years. But I was only married to her for a few years at the time. Of course, she was freaking out, saying, "Why is the FBI is in the FBI? That room? Uh, who did I marry? And what did you do?" You know. <laughs> So they, they wanted me to take down the show. And when I laughed at them and told them, I said, no, well, if you guys aren't smart enough to hide it, I'm not going to be smart enough to just, you know, let you let you get away with it. Wow. Um, and so they went to the studio and killed the deal. I lost really? a lot of money, had to go tuck my tail between my legs and get a job at Oracle and, and restart oh, my career. Crap. But I never forgot that incident. And it really started me thinking more deeply about not just where the commercial sector was in terms of technology development, but if I were part of the government, I would be three, five, as much as 10 years or more 
ahead of that sector in terms of how do I apply it to our most the most top secret endeavors, espionage, cybersecurity, national security, weapons development. There you go. And you so, know, go ahead. We, we've we've seen some examples of this in in uh, history. You know where they unleashed that virus that went after Iranian uh, nu nuclear um, nuclear sites. Stuxnet, yeah, that was yeah. actually developed at that same laboratory. Yeah, and then we've seen some of the rumblings out of I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Planeteer Technologies, Planeteer Technologies, the yep. software company in in the thing, uh, and some of the things. I mean, e even like discussions about AI now that are being talked about. Uh, Elon Musk has his comments and, and some of the stealth things. But yeah, I think at one point with the sus, the Susnex, Sexnet, yes, yes, with with that virus, one of the problems were is it started getting loose from Iran, and then they had they're like, oh shit, we got to protect ourselves from our own virus, right? They, they, it we we do have a tendency, and, and I think that's one of the themes of my book. My books is that our right now our technologies are advancing faster than our ability to control them either morally mm. or legally um and that has some real significant implications on society and domestic stability and peace in a number of things and so I'm, I'm i'm using that as a vehicle to really kind of raise larger questions there you go. Um, and um, so I look at and and I, I always emphasize that it's not the technology itself. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of sci fi where artificial intelligence somehow becomes uh, uh, malevolent, um, uh, some sort of takes on some sort of anti humanistic sort of views and it becomes evil. Uh, but I don't necessarily see artificial intelligence as either benign or malevolent. It the real danger comes from. Um, we have tens, dozens, tens of billions of dollars each year being invested in artificial intelligence by major corporations, major governments around the world, and even some uh, secret ones done by billionaires basically trying to develop their own um, uh, edge. The, the, the dark money, the, you know, the things that we don't know, and the question I always ask is, are any of those, any of those entities looking out for the good of humanity? Or are they looking out for ways to increase their profit share, increase their uh, ability to influence people's decisions, influence people to control population, control enemies, um, be better at war? Um, to to there's are, are any of those entities really doing it for um, purely um, um, good reasons? And the answer is no. Really. That seems surprising to me. And uh, well, I, there's certainly there's some there's some good that's coming out of it. There, but sure. there's always a either a profit motive, a market share motive, a um, a domination motive. Um, you know, uh, we and there are some good examples of AI. So, for example, there and there's multiple. The other thing most most people don't realize is that there's multiple types of AI. And not one AI doesn't really fit all of the models within that that kind mm -hmm. of general term. And you can take something called a narrow ANI, an artificial narrow intelligence, and that might be an intelligence that looks purely at CAT scans uh, and trying to detect uh, cancer cells. Hmm. And it's actually they've trained the AI so that the AI is much faster and much and more accurate than the best doctors out there. Wow. And so that's a good application. Now, that's going to come at a cost there, that gets <laughs> filtered into our insurance costs and everything else. Yeah. Right. There you go. But now you have other, you go to the other end of the spectrum and you have uh, weapon systems mm -hmm. um, being made with AI. And the real danger there is uh, there, there's an international treaty called LAWS, Lethal Autonomous Weapon Systems, that basically says that you can use AI for purposes of making your system perform at a higher level of performance, such mm -hmm. as finding the target faster, more accurately, uh, changing the trajectory of your missile so that it's more accurate, um, uh, using fuel efficiency so they can go farther. Um, there are a number of ways that you can use AI, but we shouldn't be using AI to both define the target, um, isolate the target, and then pull the trigger, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there always should be a human involved in that decision to make a kill shot. Um, and so we're now, the problem is um, China, the US, uh, Russia, Iran, North Korea are among the small number of countries, 140 countries have signed up and say, yeah, this is a good idea. We should limit legally with treaties the kind, the use of this new technology. Those that are most advanced in the technology have refused to sign. 
Of course. Yeah. It's all about power. So let's get into how this incorporates into your books. I'm, I'm looking at your website right now, and one of the, the pitch things on the books is, if Indiana Jones had the technological savvy of Elon Musk, uh, and, you know, I mean, James Bond, those those thrillers sure. were were amazing because of, you know, the technology of uh, what yeah. was it? It was Q uh, technology. And it, that was always what made the movies intriguing with some of the different ways he would incorporate that. So let, let's talk about some of these, the books. I don't know if you want to start with the curse sure. of Cortez and move through them, or uh, if we should start with Lack Arc, uh, last arc and move backward. Oh, well, let's start with Cortez and we'll move forward. Cortez in part because Cortez stands by itself and it was the first book I wrote. And I, I wrote Cortez um, during my career. Uh, for the most part. It took me well over a decade, close to 15 years to research all the elements of it. Wow. It started off as a short story uh, because my when I, I was a single parent for my son, uh, he liked to read. And so I, I started writing. I wanted to write short stories for him. And of course, when he was 11 and 12, he loved pirates and treasures and lost civilizations and all of that kind of stuff that we all did. And so, but I, as always, I wanted to have the story based on something true. I wanted to also teach him history, mythology, archaeology. I wanted to use those stories to basically teach something factual. Um, and so the story that captivated me that was true was in 1672, Henry Morgan took 36 ships, 2,000 men to raid the city of Panama because it was the richest city in the whole new world. All of the mm -hmm. treasures from Inca Empire were stored there, treasures, silver, gold, spices, things from uh, Mexic Western Mexico were stored there. But more importantly, all of the new treasures, they'd open up the Orient. So Ming vases, Ming, Ming uh, bronzes, uh, silks, uh, tusks, all of those things that came over from the Orient were stored there. Well, Morgan decided he wanted to go after the bank. So he lost a thousand men uh, even before he got to the city. Um, so he's down to a thousand men, but even so he conquered the city in, in a day, stayed for four months, torturing people for hidden caches, brought back 30 tons, uh, over a billion, billion and a half dollars worth of plunder. Wow. And when he reached his fleet in the Caribbean, he cheated every one of his men. He gave them a pittance of the gold each and then disappeared with almost the entire treasure and, and most of the slaves on three ships, none of it ever seen again. Wow. Morgan survived and showed up with an empty ship in Port Royal, Jamaica, four months later, where he was arrested immediately by the British because he had technically broken a peace treaty. Yeah. But in London, the guy is a freaking hero. He broke the financial back of the Spanish. They were never able to recover it. Opened up the Caribbean to the English and the Dutch and the French and everybody else. And so they sent him, they, King Charles knights him as Sir Henry Morgan. They send him back to Jamaica with a garrison of soldiers to get rid of piracy. But instead of going after any pirates, he only went after one man, a man who, who captained a ship called the Cagway, which was part of his fleet, who cheated him in Panama. And then he went back and basically went into this, instead of going after his billion dollar plunder that he had already killed thousands of people to get, he went into this drunken, haunted, depressed debauchery and burned his logbooks so the world would never know what happened to his plunder. Wow. Three years after he died, the whole city of Port Real sinks into the notion, including his grave. At the time, many of the locals swore that they had been cursed by Morgan. Wow. Now, all of that is factual. And it, 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 again, it was one of those things that I couldn't get out of my head. I wanted to find out two things. One, really hard to lose, harder than you think, to lose 30 tons of stuff, three ships and 500 bodies without somebody finding something. Exactly. In fact, I, I discovered the guy who did. And I'll get back to that in just a second. Huh. The second thing I wanted to find out is what happened to Morgan. What traumatized him so deeply? What scared him so profoundly what what made him just shake in his boots and give up a billion dollars that's a lot of plunder to give up when he had the ships the power the manpower the ability to go after and get it and even if he had to pay off the men who helped him uh there was plenty there and um and then wuss out to the point where he would burn his log books and so Answering those two questions took me many, many years of researching. I, I read every book, every every biography about him, including the man who was on the trip to Panama, na named Alexander Esquemelian. Um, I researched every island he was ever known to have gone to, every place that had a rumor, every place that had a Morgan name slapped on a tourist door. 
and I went diving in places that, that were interesting. I, wow. I, I surveyed uh, Mayan ruins and along the journey. I had a cartel thug threatened to kill me, um, which I had to deal with separately. Um, it was it was an adventure in and of itself. And there was a guy named F.A. Mitchell Hedges in 1906 to 1911 was digging on an island called Roatan. Six months before he disappeared from the island entirely, he claimed that he had found Atlantis. Oh, wow. A really weird claim. Most people laughed him to scorn. Um, several months later, he disappears. Now, the islanders at the time thought that he had died. You know, it was a very treacherous island. He was exploring caverns and caves. He was off uh, treacherous reefs. Maybe he fell overboard. You never know. Well, he shows up in New York a few months after that with six million dollars of 1911 dollars, so it's like 250 million or more today. Wow! Um, of newly smelted gold, so he had he had smelted it down so he nobody could tell the origins of where the gold had come from. And when they asked him where he found the gold, he lied to them as well, just like Morgan. He wouldn't tell them. He basically gave them a true a story that they knew right away was was a lie. He wouldn't really change his story. He went to England, bought a castle, and wrote his memoir called Danger, My Ally. I read that too. Oh, and wow. in that memoir, he never described how he found the gold on Roatan, nor would he describe what he found, what he was also famous for, which is finding the uh, crystal skull. Oh. So the... So that became a fascinating story for me. And, and I, so I started researching the island of Roatan more. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that Henry Morgan's uncle, Edward Morgan, had conquered it 30 years before that from the Spanish and turned it into a raging pirate base. Uh, and so Morgan knew the island well. And it was a volcanic set of islands, actually. Uh, they're, called the, uh, they're now called the Bay Islands off of Honduras. It used to be belong to Belize. And um, they're all, there's volcanic lava tubes and caverns and all kinds of things, many of them now submerged. To this day, the island, the locals refuse to go to some of the caverns on the east side because they, they claim that they're haunted by evil oh, spirits. Wow. Um, now, that con connected me to something I'd read about Morgan, which was that he was hyper superstitious. Um, so something happened that that really scared him deeply. Now, as it turns out, that island has conquered by the was all the indigenous people on the island were, were uh, massacred 100 years before by an Inquisition Spanish massacre. Mm -hmm. That massacre ended a 2000 year pilgrimage to the island before anybody bothered to a, say, why are people canoeing 50 miles out of here? What's so special about this place? Huh. Um, there were some ancient Mayan, they weren't Mayan, but they were ancient um, uh, markers on the island that were pre-Mayan. They were, they, were, they were so old, they really couldn't read them, so they didn't really know what they were for, but there was something mm. about the island. I ultimately connected the, the pilgrimage, the island, to and by studying geology um, and a number of other things in Mayan mythology to the 5,000-year Mayan calendar. And the origins of the Mayan creation myth, which I believe is tied to the Younger Dryas asteroid event. So after learning all of this incredible epic history, and when I studied their creation myth, it, it led me into studying their end of the world prophecies written by a prophet named Shalom Balam, who actually predicted that the Spanish would come 25 years before they arrived. Mm -hmm. And so um, this was all just a real incredible adventure for me. So. I, rather than writing sort of this, you know, 100,000, you know, 100,000 word or 500,000 word sort of epic journey from across thousands of years of history, I decided to basically create modern characters um, who um, um, had a family history on the island and sort of create an action adventure thriller that as you went through um, the, 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 the actions or the, the the events within the plot that you would discover and uncover these things and connect these these events together. Um, and that was really kind of that how that story came out. As I said, it took me so long to research that by the time I finished doing it, my son was grown. So it was no longer a children's book. Um, I, and so I, I thought, okay, well, this is this is that's good because it's way too much to put in a children's book. Um, and, and that became the backstory for the Curse of Cortez. There you go, and so you bring it to modern times, and you have yeah. a uh, you have a character. Uh, tell us about the character and and what they're involved in. It's a, well, it's a family. Um, Sophia Martinez is the what she believes uh, is the last of her family name. Her she was orphaned as a child. To her parents both died tragic deaths, and her family's been under this supposed curse. Mm -hmm. um, for many generations. And she's a modern woman. She's a tour operator. She has the internet. She, uh, even though um, 
the her culture really is super superstitious. She's half Garifuna. Um, she really hates it. She hates all that stuff and wants this shadow off of her head at, because she thinks she's the last one of her family. Hmm. And so when an earthquake destroys part of the family home, it uncovers a number of ancient relics that she doesn't really understand, one of them being a blood-soaked logbook of an Inquisition executioner named Cortez, mm. based on a real person. Who, uh, and I won't go into his history, um, but there was a, uh, back at that that time when you had a, a happy mesito, um, when uh, the father died, uh, they would take the boys and they would basically uh, essentially kidnap them and, and they would be forced to live in the monastery at Mani. Mm -hmm. and serve and be trained just enough education to read and write so that they could serve the priests and the monks. Um, when the Inquisition happened, it, the Inquisition in Mexico started because two boys from that monastery stumbled into a cave not too far from there and discovered a bunch of old Mayan um, ritualistic relics that were taboo at the time. Mm -hmm. And so that event uh, started the Inquisition. And when they got to the time where they were doing these horrific tortures of the Mayan and the local indigenous um, people, the priests were too self-righteous and holy to do it. So they would actually um, use a lot of these half-breeds to basically do these horrific tortures against their own people. Jesus. And that was that that was the Cortez. And so she finds this this uh, story, and and it, as part of her, she starts by going to a local museum to try and find the history, thinking that the factual history will dispel this baloney about a curse. Um, but it starts to unravel. She has to discover a relative she never knew existed who did, who inherited three pages torn from this curse, from this log book um, that contained the, the, the curse itself. Uh, he has to engage his son, who he hasn't spoken to in a decade because his son blames his father for his mother's death. Oh. And so there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of family forgiveness. There's a lot of um, um, feelings of resentment, redemption. Uh, they have to work together to basically um, kind of get through the plots of the story. And as they do, they're uncovering this history. They're uncovering the connections to the Mayan creation. And now at the time, uh, one of the things I should mention is 13,000 years ago when the younger asteroid hit, the islands of Broatan, the Bay Islands themselves, were not islands. They were actually above ground. They were basically um, wetlands, uh, but they were um, dry. They were, they were basically part of the mainland. And so what was underneath those caverns in Roatan used to be um, accessible from dry land. And in the 60s and later in the 80s, there were a number of uh, roads carved into the coral in Belize and off of uh, Honduras that led directly out into the ocean for miles until they got too, too deep. Um, and I believe that those roads were part of that culture that actually created that. Now, a number of technology or a number of um, researchers, including um, uh, Graham Hancock and others, have talked about um, the cultures in Americas and elsewhere prior to the Younger Dryas event. And we've seen um, 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 cave paintings or basically on a wall in Colombia that go back 20,000 years. Mm -hmm. So the Mayan creation myth says that we were created, that the world was created, destroyed three times before the Spanish arrived in 1514. And so I finally realized that the Mayan calendar, which is 5,000 years long, is, is part of what they call an epoch. And if I followed those epochs back, the second creation in the Mayan creation myth says that it was destroyed by a, um, a horrible fire and flood. And that equates to the archaeology studies or archaeology that happened after the uh, Younger Dryas. We have this uh, archaeology, we'll talk about this two, three inch thick black mat that covers all of North America, all the way down to, to, to Columbia, including Roatan. And so underneath that, basically that was the fire that destroyed everything. And that that same asteroid caused the glacial, um, the North uh, uh, American glaciers to melt, which caused the um, flooding of the badlands, basically caused coastal flooding and would have basically submerged all of this wetland. So it tied all the way back, it, all of it tied directly to the Mayan creation myth, their, their myth of Jobalba, which is their underwater place of death and fear. And I, and, and these, I believe that that tied to the caverns that 
um, Mitchell Hedges discovered that are still avoided today and now submerged mm. um, that had to do with this lost civilization and the, these this sunken history. It's too bad we, it was all sunken that we, you know, we it makes it harder to access it. This is amazing, the amount of work that you're putting into the research on your books and, and into your books and stuff. Uh, let's get the other two books in here for time. Sure. Uh, the next book in your in your uh, writing was uh, the book Swarm. Swarm Artificial now, Intelligence Decodes. Swarm in takes the books. program that escaped. Now, uh, incidentally, in 2016, uh, CNN reported how Russia had hacked the CIA cyber toolkit. Mm -hmm. And in that cyber toolkit, it further confirmed my earlier analysis that, the, that brought the FBI to my home. So all of the programmable functions I had assumed uh, were in this program uh, were actually included in that toolkit, including what we now call the deep fake video technology, oh. um, which is so I actually turned that fix, that factual program into a, one of my fictional characters. I gave it a name, Sylvia, Sophisticated Language Virtual Intelligence Algorithm. Oh. Sylvia has attached itself to this underground hacker group group, a white hacker kind of group, um, white hacks, which are basically benevolent. Mm -hmm. um, and a character, and the main character there is a, he goes by the name of Derek Taylor, but Derek Taylor is not his real name. It was actually mm -hmm. the name of a friend who was killed in an explosion uh, that was meant for him mm -hmm. um, after he had hacked a Bilderberg Illuminati server. And so trying to hide from those who still want him dead, um, he basically has partnered up with this fugitive AI the, um, and um, uh, the AI has now um, one of the kind of the twists in the in the story is that the AI has now decoded end time prophecy. Uh oh. Now, what's interesting about that premise is that it allows me it, it allows the reader to basically explore all of the various crises that we've been uh, that have been accumulating around the world for the last couple dozen years. Um, including climate, um, rise of fascism, um, uh, population, loss of griefs, um, and prophecies or a number of prophecies in Revelation that, that are called the seven trumpets that talk about uh, loss of a third of the fish of the sea, third of the birds of the air, a third of the beasts of the sea, pollution of all these rivers around the world, something that would have been un just unimaginable 2000 years ago when this was written. But if you go through what triggered me uh, on that connection was that uh, if you actually will read National Geographic and other scientific magazines, you realize that we're already in the uh, third, sixth extinction. The loss of those beasts have already happened. The mm -hmm. loss of the feast sea stocks have already happened mm -hmm. and is actually documented. The loss of the bird flocks have already happened and already documented. And I started thinking in terms of you know, you know, there are a lot of people think in terms of prophecy as sort of this very, you're the wacko on the corner wearing a, a burlap sack uh, and and carrying a sign saying the end's near. Mm -hmm. but what it's I me on Wednesdays. Yeah. <laughs> but what I started saying, well, is there is there a more objective? And then if you if you listen to a lot of um, 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 pastoral or, or biblical teachers, there's a lot of allegory. They focus on the allegories, and frankly, I found a lot of the um, interpretations had a lot of cultural, religious, racial, uh, ethnic biases in it and how they interpreted the allegories. But I realized that I could look past the allegory and look at the actual results uh, that happened. And I could tie those results to a factual documented event. And so I started looking at how would, a, how would an AI, how would I, how would I objectively evaluate this to determine whether the, there was facts or there was a factual premise for this um, by using mathematics, regression analysis, probability analysis, and the, the things that an AI would use in order to uh, evaluate these kind of things. And so that made the connection there. And so I tie it then, right? That's the basic characters in the story. Um, there's a naval lieutenant who's a female. Her name is Jen Scott. She's the admiral's daughter. She's very ambitious. She wants to get out of the admiral's shadow. She's assigned to investigate this uh, this missing AI and this uh, hacker named uh, Derek Taylor, and that kind of in, it kind of evolves the plot there. But I deal with um, uh, real facts in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, how many identities have been hacked over the last ten years? What are the likely things that Russia and China might be doing with those identities that might weaponize that information using AI, using AI to do cyber espionage and cyber warfare kinds of things. Now, the U.S. is one of the most vulnerable nations in the world for cyber attack, uh, even though we have the most advanced defenses, uh, those defenses are not universal. 
um, across all information and platforms and corporations and infrastructure. And so if I were to develop an AI that would want if I wanted to basically develop an AI that would weaken the U.S. in advance of an uh, invasion of Taiwan or some other uh, major invasion, I would attack our Internet. I would basically just attack our DNS sites. They're limited in number. The mm -hmm. DNS sites are basically the, the linchpin of the whole Internet system that basically converts IP addresses into Chris, the Chris Voss show, right? Mm -hmm. The name, the web name. And uh, if I could use an AI to basically bring down the DNS sites, I could basically dismantle the internet in a matter of hours or days. But we'd lose the Chris Voss Show podcast. We'd lose no. information. We'd lose communications. Yeah. We'd lose banking. We'd lose commerce. Uh, it might affect some of the our infrastructure because we're now cloud-based. And so you now basically have a scenario that could definitely weaken. And so that's definitely. part of the premise of the, word, of the book Swarm. The title swarm actually comes from a DARPA weapon that's in development today in Nevada. It was tested in the 2020 Gaza war that can, there's two versions of this weapon system. One is a six inch drone system that the Navy has developed and the army's developing a 15, 18 inch um, drone weapon. And these are all connected weapons. So they, there's, they communicate with each other at the rate of about 52,000 communications per second. Uh, signals per second so that they don't crash into each other. They can form um, uh, different um, uh, formations. They can do, they can pass intelligence along. They have high speed cameras. So if I want to do, if I wanted to go into a um, urban village and, and clear it of all enemy combatants, uh, it's really dangerous for me to send people in to do it. Mm -hmm. I could do what we do today, which is bomb the crap out of it, which basically uh, destroys the village for any future use. Or we could send in these drones. Now, imagine being surrounded by a, a, a swarm of a thousand hornets. There's no way that you can swipe and shoot and do whatever you want to basically defend yourself. But it's really almost an indefensible weapon. Now, imagine those hornets are 15 inch drones with explosives attached to them. <laughs> You know, we're kind of seeing a, a, a perfect example of that. I mean, yeah. in the in the war with Ukraine and Russia, mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've been telling people, especially with the popcorn explosion elements of Russian tanks in their design, um, you know, you see these videos now of these drones literally just hanging over soldiers and dropping bombs on <laughs> tanks. Yeah. And, and I'm like, I'm like, I think tanks are dead now because uh, drones... You know, these, and they're these little commercial drones, too, that they're just Those using. Those are manually the managed commercial drones being yeah. used on these weapons. Imagine a swarm of 1,000 or 10,000 of them um, where they're basically automated with artificial intelligence, communicating with each other. And that lethal weapon um, scenario I talked about a few minutes ago, it would be impractical or impossible to basically have a soldier behind each drone deciding when to pull the kill trigger. Mm -hmm. So now you've got an autonomous lethal weapon system that has very few defenses against it. So that's that's the premise. That's the the structure around which Swarm is built. Now the last arc is the second in the series. It deals with all, all the same characters. It goes through at this point our hero Derek Taylor is now a fugitive, um, made so by Jen Scott. Um, he's now um, looking for the the program Sylvia has gone missing again and has left him a bunch of breadcrumb clues and tying back to this concept of, of prophecy Sylvia basically leads him to discover a number of things which are true now part of it goes back to a prophecy that talks about a third temple which for many many years I, I thought was practically conceptually impossible to happen given the politics and the and the archaeology and everything in the region and then I discovered some and I so I started investigating well is there are there any facts on the ground that exist today that could possibly lead to that scenario uh, with a little bit of speculation? So the the name the third the last arc comes from two arcs in, in history. One is in there the Ark of the Covenant that's been in Ethiopia. It was actually there for nine hundred years. It left Israel twenty six hundred years ago. It was on Elephant Island for several hundred years until the Romans. Uh, destroyed that temple. Then it was taken to Ethiopia, where it was in synagogues until the Templars came through and moved it into churches. Mm -hmm. if long factual history. There's archaeology behind it. it, it whether uh, and it, it's really been there. Janu most people don't know, and that's been studied. Graham Hancock done specials. Other people have done specials. Um, but in January 21, 
Um, the Ethiopian army and a militia stormed the city of Aksum and basically massacred 750 men, women, and children at the church where the Ark was kept, including the Guardian. The Ark was stolen and sold on the black market. Wow. Um, so the last Ark speculates who in the region has the money, the power, and the influence, and the desire to have an ancient Jewish relic. This, that ties into a second Ark. In the 1960s, there was a copper scroll found uh, in the city of Qumran or outside in the caves of Qumran where all the other Dead Seas were scroll found. Mm -hmm. uh, different than the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were all found in um, alabaster or um, uh, clay jars, rather. Um, it was found in sort of this uh, fake mud wall. So it was basically hidden. I don't even think the people in, in um, who wrote the most of the Dead Sea Scrolls even knew it was there. And wow. in this... Uh, uh, pre-Babylonian uh, proto-Hebrew type of language. And this story uh, actually is confirmed by a story in 2 Maccabees. So it's confirmed in the, in the Jewish uh, tradition. Um, but in this, the scroll turned out, it took them years to unravel it and clean it and decipher it. But it had 64 locations where temple priests before the Babylonian invasion had hidden, hidden tens of billions of dollars worth of temple treasures. Wow. And in the 64th location, there was a second copper scroll that described where Jeremiah hid the Ark of Testimony made by Moses. Hmm. For 50 years, no one's been able to find any of those locations. They were all looking in the city, assuming it was in the city of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem had been destroyed and rebuilt so many times they thought, well, we'll never find it. Well, about six, seven years ago, an American, ironically, came along who was an investigator, and he actually decoded all 64 locations underneath the ruins of Qumran itself, Wow. which the original Qumran goes back to the Babylonian Empire era. And so they he convinced the Israeli Sanhedrin, which is their kind of priestly group for a new third temple, to um, get interested. They got the Israeli archaeology and antiquities group um, interested. They went out and they did metal scans on each of these locations and found non-ferrous metals in every one of them. They dug down about two or three feet even though the scroll said that they had to dig down uh, like nine to 12 feet. But then they said, well, we didn't find anything. They covered it up and they tried to squelch it. They didn't want the rumors to go around that there was treasure there because Qumran is part of the Palestinian West Bank on the Dead Sea. Okay. If Israel tried to dig there, they would lose everything. It would go into this military warehouse. It would be tied up in a tribunal. They would never see anything ever again. It's like the last scene of the Indiana Jones uh, movie all over again. Yeah, right. where it goes into the, it goes warehouse. the giant warehouse and forget it. It's lost again now. Another 2,000 years before we find it. Um, and so, but that was about the time that Netanyahu and Israel started really pushing for a single state solution. Mm -hmm. So under the premise that under a single state solution is the only solution where they could actually dig those treasures out of, out of Qumran and actually own them, including how to get to the Ark of Testimony made by Moses. Wow. So That's extraordinary. I, I, those are some of the factual pieces. I also include the solar winds hack in the story and how that the solar winds hack was the most dangerous hack in our history. We've spent billions of dollars defending against an external attack on our infrastructure. The solar winds was an ingenious uh, hack because it went through, it has moles within the software industry that included this virus within a normal software update. 18,000 corporations, eight major U.S. Um, agencies all had this, had these updates, and it was discovered by accident nine months after the update had occurred. Wow. We still don't know for sure. They can't find any incidents of the uh, program disabling anything. They can't find any incidents of the program stealing any information, which tells me it was there to add information. Oh. That's important because a Rand Corporation study that went to the DOD in 2019 said that one of the top 10 risks that we have in our national security is what they call AI data poisoning. Hmm. So AI is you, it based on tons and tons of data. For example, the chat GPT software that just came out has 175 billion individual data points. The hmm. next version of it will have 100 trillion data points. Jesus. But if I can start introducing bad data into that mix so that I cause a I could eventually cause a 
sabotage of that AI, and we have AI running our infrastructure, our national security, um, some of many of our submarines and nuclear power plants are run by AI because it's more efficient than using humans. If I could basically introduce that sabotage, it's an untraceable form of sabotage. Oh, wow. So I bring in all of these things into the mix, and then I add a speculative um, scenario of a former U.S. president. Uh, he's unnamed. He's just a fictional president, but he's under criminal indictment. Uh, and rather than going to trial, he flees to Saudi Arabia, where he declares asylum, where he and his buddy, the crown prince, restart a peace deal for political theater using one of these arcs as a um, incentive to basically start to have peace with Israel and build a third temple. So we've we've kind of blended from from the original swarm into the last arc, right? There was yeah. somewhere in here we yeah. we moved from that because I was gonna yeah. I was gonna try and make sure we siloed that. Um, so we were and and this is uh, uh, the last arc is part two in your S N O chronicles. Uh, what does the S N O stand for? Um, Spynet Online. It's there we go. About snow. So okay. we, we call it Snow. It's an underground group of, uh, and the way Snow is structured is it's um, people from all walks of life, um, some spies, some bankers, um, taxi drivers, uh, business people, um, every walk of life are basically the informants of this program that escaped is basically using its um, um, uh, deep fake video technology to basically create relationships with individuals as sources of information into the real world, the analog, mm -hmm. consider the analog world. And so there's tens of millions of people within snow. Most of them don't even know that they're talking to a computer. And most of them, even the people high up in the, in the organization don't know who all these people are. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially a, a worldwide set of confidential informants, as it were, basically in relationship with this computer or the, the hacker, Derek Taylor, who goes by the alias Flapjack. Um, and so they have relationships with these people and they're trying to basically go after the world systems that are starting, that are dominating them. Um, mm -hmm. Bilderberg, World Economic Forum, IMF, you know, basically these global globalized systems that, that um, are, are making the wealthy wealthier while making us more subjective to the wealthy. There you go. Um, and um, and so it, it's it's got it's it's dealing with climate change, population. It's trying to deal with all these other crises that are facing us, but doing so outside of this the normal governmental um, structure. I, I wanted a hero that was different than your typical CIA, Navy SEAL, FBI trained to kill you 14 ways before breakfast, <laughs> sir. Um, to a sarcastic, uh, smart mouth, um, you know. Um, sardonic hacker who who just can't help but uh, mouth off once in a while and do um, the characters so, pass between both books is it the same the character characters between both books yeah okay. and so you're really you're getting more character development as there now most none of the characters really they, they don't understand what sylvia is trying to tell them with this prophecy stuff they're all agnostic mm -hmm. It doesn't have to do, it strips away the dogma and the doctrine and looks at more, it's, it's a vehicle to look more at the incredible levels of correlation between things that were prophesied that would happen in this time frame and things that are actually happening. Mm. And tries to get people to ask questions and have thoughts about, well, what does that mean? What is that, what kind of personal choices does that really drive me to have? And what will personal choices will it drive the characters to have? And how do they evaluate their, their, their careers and their future and their plans and wealth and things of this nature relative to that, that idea. Now, you know, and on some levels, I, I, I try to argue that, you know, I've, every study I've ever read is consistent. The death rate's a hundred percent. Wow. The question is how we live, right? We're all, we're all going to face that one way or another, whether it comes from a catastrophe or natural causes. Mm -hmm. If we knew that we only had a certain amount of time, how would that change our perspectives and choices in life? Yeah. Right. And so it, the, the, the use of prophecy is a way of saying prophecy is not so much about how God will destroy humanity, but it's describing how humanity will do that to ourselves. Uh. And if we see that coming, if we can see that coming, how would that change our priorities and our choices as individuals? Yeah. And really, it only can happen at an individual level because many of these things are motions or trains that we can't stop. Well, you've incorporated some amazing things into this where, 
uh, you know, these are things that are being talked about. I mean, we just had uh, Davos, and the biggest topic at Davos was chat, uh, chat, G, chat G, the chat, uh, yeah, GPT. I can't say chat. I guess uh, I don't know. I can't <laughs> chat about chat. Um, I it's already infected my brain. I don't know what that means. Um, but no, that was the biggest subject there. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, all my friends that are in technology and Silicon Valley space are talking about it ad nauseum. Um, you know, it's almost become like the new cryptocurrency. I'm not comparing that because, uh, there's, you know, we've seen a lot of, uh, sort of weird stuff going on with that, but it, it seems like I, I, I read something that this is one of the most, uh, interesting ideas or uh, concepts to come forth. And since like maybe the birth of social media or just about, uh, iPhones or any sort of new technology that we've had, people are really interested in it and what the potential is and some of the downside of it. I mean, a lot, some of my friends are, you know, yeah. they're, they're copywriters. They're people that do PR and write co ad copy. And they're kind of freaked out a little bit right now because they're being told I that they might be out of a job. Yeah, implications for misinformation um, and propaganda are, are high. We're already seeing Jap GPT being used to develop malicious software. Oh, wow. Um, um, and so it's basically an AI writing more, uh, more AI, more software. Mm. And one of the concepts I deal with in Swarm and, and The Last Arc is what happens when we start having our AI technology advancing our quantum technology, mm. we create quantum AI. Quantum AI basically then solves problems faster and then feeds that back into the original AI. And what happens when this cycle of consciousness starts to accelerate? And there's a number of companies uh, and, and individuals, something like Creative Machines Lab out of Columbia University and about a dozen others are actually working today on consciousness models for AI. And that's developing. So, um, so some of the chat GPT technology has been a, around for a, a bit of time. What's unique about ChatGPT is they've created an open model that just anybody else can come in and use and cre cre pose questions to. But the technology, which I incorporate into the Sylvia tech, um, program, um, has been around for uh, it, it acceler accelerating extremely rapidly, for sure. Uh, and it does have uh, both positive and negative uh, implications to it. And so we have to look at what's the nature of man uh what's of the human nature to basically use this for good or for evil and the answer is going to be a little bit of both there you go great thrillers great uh great in and in, uh insight and technology that's being used and so you're right on the cusp of what's going on in our world today uh there was someone who uh great reviews too as well a pulse pounding grab you by the throat uh thrill ride that's me on, <laughs> that's me on fridays uh you know uh someone else wrote uh on the arc that uh it's a it's a great version between tom clancy and another writer i i seem to dan have brown. lost the, dan brown I yeah to I lost dan flipping. brown and tom clancy were to write a book together looked something like this That's and they awesome. were convinced that both clancy and brown would be um uh, proud to call me a contemporary there you so, go uh any any final thoughts you want to share on people before we go out yeah, I, 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 I'd love you to, to get the books and read, but ask questions. Use it as a, way, a vehicle to basically uh, think about the world as it is and make personal choices. And while I'm dealing with some very intense topics, uh, um, I, I like to have characters that are smart, witty, uh, warm, have good friendships. And so you're, you're balancing out that humanity with the things that can happen. So you're not really ending with a dystopic type of field. You're ending with a a sense that you want to follow these characters through more adventures. And so it, it's been a great experience for me. I get to do what I love, which is research and get into really intellectually deep topics. Um, but I, rather than talk about it in a, a rather dense um, non-fictional format, uh, a thriller is the perfect format for me because I get to have an exciting plot and get you to turn the pages and, uh, and get you to think. There you go. Uh, Guy, give us your dot uh, coms where you want people to find you on the yeah. internet, please. GuyMorrisBooks.com. It's pretty easy. And that will take you to buy links and everything else you'll need to know to ask questions. It gives you fact versus fiction. If I talk about programs being able to program themselves, I'll give you a link to an article. Uh, so all of these things that I'm talking about, they're not sci-fi. They're actually linked to things that are going on right now today. There you go. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, Guy. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for having me.
There you go. And thanks to our audience for tuning in. Uh, order up the books wherever fine books are sold. Uh, go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, and our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and all those crazy places. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.